construction side. So why don't we start with introductions. Uh, Brandon? I'm Brandon Weiss, uh, Weiss Building Development, home builder and modeler. Um, Chicago land area focusing solely on sustainable construction, so this is a perfect fit for us. Real excited to be a part of this project. Um, I'm a graduate master builder through the uh, National Association of Home Builders, lead AP through the USGBC, um, and also a master certified green professional through NHB. Um, so, you know, we got a lot of designations, done a lot of t uh, time, spent a lot of time on continuing education and things like that. So, a project like this was a, a great fit for us, and real excited about being a part of it. Uh, I'm Eric Barton, built more insulated concrete. Uh, Brand and I have a similar path. Um, <clears throat> I'm a graduate master builder as well and certified or an AP. Tom and I are uh, certified passive house consultants. Uh, we met each other in training. Uh, my company does insulated concrete forms and um, uh, super insulated structures. Um, so insulated concrete forms and uh, what else was I going to say? Um, I don't know. Day. Yeah, it's been a long day. So that's it. <laughs> okay. Barry, you want to say a few words? Hi, I'm Barry Stevens from Zender America, and uh, we will be talking more about the heat recovery ventilation system here. Zender is a Swiss company. We are distributing the Comfo Systems heat recovery, energy recovery ventilation systems, and uh, you see that some of the ducting and so forth, we'll go through that. And uh, I've got a couple of other guys here with me from our company. All right. Uh, Kevin, you want to introduce yourself here since you're the local rep? Thanks. Hi, I'm Kevin Rapp. I'm also with Zender. I'm the Midwest representative. Um, so we've got a whole team out here because uh, we've got such a strong showing out here. We're excited to see that there's a lot of people behind the progressive building and we won't be here to help. Thanks. All right. I'm going to clip this on so I can gesticulate. But it's funny because, okay, this will work, right? All right, good. So there's uh, cards up here and brochures if you want to contact anybody afterwards. I'm sure everybody would be happy to do that. Um, so I imagine most people here are familiar in general with passive house principles. Hopefully some of you have come to the previous um, presentations we've done on the house. Uh, we, I think in, uh, I'm going to say July, no, June maybe? We presented about the design concept and everything, but um, in a nutshell, not to spend too much time on the passive house basics, we're, we're designing a really, really low energy building, and we're doing that by super insulating it and making the thermal shell airtight, as airtight as we can. Um, so uh, it was an interesting project for me. I, I had finished training and, and had done a almost passive house and was really hoping to get a project. And, in training, Eric and I were talking about ICFs and this kind of thing. And in the back of my mind, I was thinking, you know, that could be a really nice fit because ICFs, insulated concrete forms, are, are inherently airtight, this concrete wall. So then it just so happened that this client called me up and said, hey, we saw that you did this. We want a passive house, but we want it to be concrete. Can you do that? It's like, yeah, actually, I think I can. Um, or I think, I think we can. So um, it, was a great, it was a great thing that then we met with Brandon and Eric and put this team together. Um, so Eric is the thermal shell. He's basically responsible for everything that has to do with insulation and airtightness. And we're right in the kind of tail end of that, and we're getting ready for finishes. Um, so uh, just to tell you a little bit about the components here, um, the ICF walls obviously are a uh, key component. We have uh, a wood air barrier on the ceiling, which will show you a lot of fiberglass insulation above that in the attic. Um, concrete slab on the bottom of this thermal shell, which has eight inches of EPS foam insulation underneath it. And then, um, and then we have these windows. So these windows are by a company called Zola, which is a uh, relatively new company um, in, in Poland, started by a German architect who trained in Switzerland <laughs> and lives in, lives in Colorado now. So he's a, he's a real, like, uh, you know, global guy, uh, Florian Spire. Um, we priced out a number of windows on this project, um, and there's a big range in cost. And uh, basically what we found was that there are a lot of uh, PVC windows. Hey, uh, Jason, would you mind do me a favor and, and grabbing that window corner sample right there and bring it to me? Um, we, we, we found that basically in this climate where it, it gets good and cold for a long time, we want to have a, a super high-performing window. and we, we need a triple pane window, a double, double low E, argon filled, 
And so this kind of glass setup is what we need. There are a few options in North America, but most of them are fiberglass. I mean, made in North America. Most of them are fiberglass. Most are made in Canada. Thermotech, Fibertech, um, Sirius. There's a couple of uh, couple of options. Um, but there's a lot that's coming out of Europe, and all of a sudden there's just a whole slew of windows that are starting to hit the U.S. market and get more in our hands. Is Marat still here? Yeah. yeah. So Marat is a, is a guy who's a member of our group. He reps uh, Unilux. Sorry, I was going to say, yeah, one of your competitors. Um, and, and they have a product like this. This is Zola's uh, UPVC. So this is a PVC window, which is really cost effective uh, and super high performance because this is really where most of the performance comes from, right here in this glass. High solar heat gain coefficient, so you get a lot of thermal help in the wintertime. Uh, very low U value. I mean, these are like R8 or 9 by NFRC standards. R9. R9. So, um, so it's a super high performing window. Um, we didn't want to go UPVC. We had enough of budget that we could afford a wood window, and so we wound up with the Zola. Um, and uh, just to show you a little bit about how these tilt turn windows work because it's not that common in the US. Um, they're open in and you notice that they have these like triple stepped um, seals. Thank you. I'm just going to struggle with words today so help is appreciated. So here are these three compressible seals that uh, give this a great air tightness. They just installed another project, did the, air, the blower door on it and got, a, got one of the lowest um, ratings that this house came out to, not this house, the one that Zola just installed was a 0.18 at ACH 50, so it's super airtight. So a big part of that are all the penetrations, right? So um, anyway, this is the, the casement function, open in, and then you can go like this and just get a little bit of ventilation like that, and it doesn't sweep everything off that you've accumulated on the sill if you're like me. So um, anyway, this is obviously just the temporary hardware. There is a really nice... Uh, German roto hardware that goes with this, but um, we're not going to install that until the very end. Not that I know of, no. All these are being made in, in Europe. So they had to come over on a container, which is something to know when you do this. You have to make room on the site for a container and pay for the container to be there, or you have to unpack the whole darn thing. And if, these things are like furniture. And, you know, if you break the glass, well, <laughs> it's going to be however many weeks to get the next one in. So, um, so there's some things to think about if you're, gonna, if you're gonna be bringing windows over from Europe. But your rep will walk you through that. So um, <clears throat> anyhow, uh, so the, the windows are a key component. Um, the ventilation system is a key component. We'll talk about that later. And then the mechanical systems for this house, uh, again, because it's super low energy, it takes very little to heat and cool. Uh, that's point number one. Point number two is, the temperature changes in a super insulated building really slowly. So you don't have to worry about, you know, the living room is, is 70 degrees, but that bedroom is like 58. That doesn't happen. You're just not losing enough heat. So it tends to be very even through the house. And therefore, you don't need to have a ducted system in a fairly compact building like this. So you don't need to duct your heating and cooling. So we have two point source units, and they're supplied by Mitsubishi. They're little, what they're called, mini-split heat pumps. Uh, and if anybody, any of you are here for that presentation, Mark Kuntz from Mitsubishi Electric uh, came and gave a really nice uh, presentation about how they work. But the, that black line set with the copper sticking out over the window is where one wall unit goes. So there's a little compressor that sits out in the north side yard. And then um, the wall unit sits there. And it's about, you know, yay big. And it just will blow a little bit of heat in the recirculating system or a little bit of cooling as required. There's another one upstairs in the master bedroom. So, um, so the conventional heating system is not required in a, in a, in a passive house. Um, so those are the key components. Uh, Design-wise, the things that I had to figure out that, is un, that was unusual for me as a, as a you know, US trained architect is how to design a thermally bridge-free building and how to design an airtight building. And so those are the main details we want to point out as we kind of walk through here. But basically what they tell you in passive house training is that you should be able to put your pen down on the, um, you know, the perimeter of the building, the section view, and, and draw a continuous airtight line 
that describes exactly where your air tightness is going to, how it's going to be achieved. So here, it's basically the concrete walls that meet up with the plywood that we attach to the underside of the trusses, the wood trusses on the ceiling, or the, or the second floor, the roof trusses. Um, and then we drop the ceiling below that, so we're not penetrating all through our airtight layer. You cannot penetrate the airtight layer. And then um, on the basement, we have, a, we have a plastic sheet under the slab, which is a very heavy, uh, it's called Stego wrap. And that comes up on the inside, and we taped it off to the ICF. So, what's that? How many mil? 500, yeah. It's, uh, yeah, it's a really, it's a really thick. You'll, you'll see it down there. And then, of course, every penetration in that airtight layer has to be really rigorously, rigorously studied. And I, I don't know how many conversations we've had about the windows, but um, as you look at some of the windows, some are almost airtight so far, and some aren't. So those ones over there where you see the foam are not yet. They don't have the airtight layer. Um, these here where you see the white tape around, this is Sega tape. Sega is a brand that uh, most people who are doing passive houses are using in one way or another. Uh, they have a lot of products that are made for very specific situations. I mean, this is a pre-bent two peel away strip, uh, fits into a corner type tape for interior ceiling of windows. And then they have this green stuff here. Um, you know, they have tapes that breathe, tapes that don't breathe. And um, so it's a really important part of an airtight house. You always wind up with a lot of tapes because they last. And um, so, tell you what, why don't we start walking? Do you guys want to? Well, why don't we take before we go, say a little more about the, the healthy, the air quality aspects, okay. and the uh, the ICF kind of specifics, maybe? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Here we go. Thanks. So beyond the passive house certification that we're, we're going for in this house, which you know really focuses on the energy efficiency, sure it has a lot to do with the air quality with the uh, Zender system and things, but um, actually sourcing the materials and looking into, doing a lot of research on what plywoods to use, uh, making sure we have you know, no plywood that we're using has, uh, it's all exterior grade, so it has no urea formaldehyde in it, but making sure the glues and resins in it also um, are healthy. So we're looking at the, a healthy house certification. Um, it's going to be a pilot project for, for them. Um, and basically, we have to turn in every material used, be it glues, adhesives, um, plywood, anything in the home has to be tested by them by third party, um, making sure that it passes their standards. And also, when the house is done, you know, besides doing the energy testing, we're also going to be doing uh, testing on SVOCs, TVOCs, formaldehyde, um, and any kind of dust particulates and things like that. So we're really doing an um, ultra-efficient but ultra-healthy home and trying to combine those two to give a, a really high-quality, well-performing home. Um, th nothing that's been done, at, at least that I know of in this area. So very exciting to, to kind of combine those two things. And, you know, as, essentially that's what green is all about, is combining health, energy efficiency, and then sustainable materials. And, you know, we've used some advanced uh, framing details here, our corner details, and two foot on center and doing that kind of stuff too. So also doing things environmentally responsible as well. Eric, you want to take over the SCF? Sure. So on this house, and uh, we have the insulated concrete forms running from the footing all the way up to the roof uh, trusses, okay? So what we achieve with that with ICFs is you have a continuous two layers of insulation on the inside and the outside that is unbroken except for wherever we have a penetration for mechanical or electrical or a window. And the windows are always the weakest element of any type of a wall system. So. You know, with our Gorilla Buck system, um, which you really can't see much anymore, um, there is, uh, the concrete is not touching the plywood. So, so the only thermal bridge we have in this entire wall is, is, is the, the, the wrap around the window, so a, a window opening. The other thing that you're gonna see, which is different, so when you take an ICF building from the footing all the way up to the roof, different than typical lumber frame construction, when you go up the stairs, you can see that our insulation plane on the inside is continuous and unbroken. Okay, and we achieved that with setting the open web trusses on a brick ledge. Okay, so in typical wood frame construction, when you take your rafter members out and you do platform framing and you take your rim joists all the way to the outside, you have the ability to make that floor, that subfloor cold because you're taking that subfloor element all the way to the exterior. With this, with the ICFs in this particular detail, it's completely inside the shell. 
So that keeps this floor a lot warmer than any other typical type of construction. Um, you also see when we get upstairs, we'll talk a little bit about the, uh, the airtight ceiling detail and what we had to do there. Um, but basically, you know, when you're running with the ICFs, the concrete, once you pour it, um, it really gives you a super airtight building. And that's one of the key components of, um, in passive houses. So uh, any other additional questions we can answer as we head up and down the tour. Yeah. Why don't we head downstairs, um, you know, watch your step on the stairs right now. We'll look at the, uh, at the basement. You can see the slab down there. So you can see that. Yeah, okay, I'll start again. Thanks. Um, so we're, we've got a, a four inch concrete slab which we, you know, when we, when we decided to frame this thing with these super strong walls, we realized there's no real good reason to put an interior load-bearing wall in here. When we can span outside wall to outside wall, uh, it makes the basement a lot simpler. There's no steel line or posts and beams. So we just have an unbroken four-inch concrete slab here sitting on eight inches of type nine uh, EPS you know, styrofoam basically insulation. And then um, that underneath that is the, uh, the plastic that wraps up. So the plastic is our radon barrier, our soil gas barrier. It comes up the sidewall, and then we tape it off with the SEGA here to the, uh, to the face of the ICF. And it's really funny because, you know, when I'm drawing these things, I've got the, the, the building section I'm drawing, I'm looking at the, the plastic coming up and taping off to this styrofoam. I think, God, it, looks, it looks really weak. You know, I want to take that plastic and, all the way back to the concrete and lock it into the concrete. Well, we couldn't do that because the bottom ICF form needs to get leveled up on the footing, and you can't have a piece of plastic in there where you're trying to level it. So we decided to basically do it this way. And after looking at that, I thought, you know, there's, there's not a lot of air moving around down there. So the, the, the worst case scenario would be there's a little bit of a, a gap where the tape and the, the EPS meet, um, but it's not like we've got a bunch of air blowing around down there. So we basically figured, we're okay. We'll tape it off to the face of the of the EPS and should be fine for air tightness. Um, here you can see a pretty complete installation in terms of the airtight layer. Uh, you can see a little bit of light. Uh, I'm sorry for the window. So this is a big Zola fixed window, three by six. You can see a little bit of light coming in on the left side of that jam right there. Um, they're going to foam that with foam uh, low expansion foam insulation from the outside before the siding goes on. Um, and that allows us to have a nice clean surface here. And we've been experimenting with these, and you can see a couple of windows where um, there, there's foam that was put on from the inside, but now we have to trim it back, and it's just kind of a mess. So, so this is the system we're, we're going to wind up using. Um, the metal clips that you can see on the jams are what we use to attach the windows to the Gorilla Buck. The Gorilla Buck is a three-quarter inch plywood that has a, a backside. It's a patented thing that goes with ICF systems. It locks into the concrete, so it's not going anywhere. Um, but it, it, it means that you only have three quarters of an inch to attach your window to. So typically, you um, like on a, on a typical American window, you have a nailing fin. You just nail it to your outside sheathing. Well, here we don't have that option. And the window installer said, well, I can give you two options. You can do a clip that screws into the, the, the side, the buck like this. Or you can just screw through the jam, uh, through the through the jam, into your buck. Well, the screws he had were like this, and if you go just a little bit past the buck, you're into solid concrete. So that's not going to work. So we decided to use the clips, even though we're going to have to tape over those for our air tightness. So in other words, when you're looking right here, um, an accumulated set of gaps like that right there would blow our air tightness for this house. So we're taking this white tape. First of all, we're, we're doing that, and then we're taking another piece of tape to cover these. So it's, you know, a lot of taping, but... Um, Lots of <laughs> yeah. are, are you taping the, the, the screws? Uh, to, because it's not the screws themselves. It's the fact that this break in plane right here okay. creates a little tiny gap, which can get air coming through. Oh. So we're going to cover that gap up by going around like that. Yeah, it's all a SEGA. This is the Corvum, which is their interior air sealing tape. So, um, yeah. So the, uh, the fact that we're clear spanning is why you're seeing these relatively deep um, trusses. Um, but it allows us, as you can see, just to have real easy 
access for plumbing and electrical and all that. What is the metal Those are gusset plates. It's just what holds it together. They just gang nail it. Kaboom. You know, it's a quick, uh, quick thing. The orange, by the way, the orange pipes are the fire protection system. River Forest requires um, fire protection for new construction. It added about eight grand to this house. I think is that right? More? Ten and a half. Okay, yeah. See, architects eight grand equals ten and a half. <laughs> <laughs> Rule of thumb. That's what I tell my clients. You you use the top core bearing? Yeah. 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 Pretty frequent with the with the. Um, you can do top core or bottom core bearing here. We wanted to um, use this brick ledge detail. Yeah, it seemed better for us to use. Yeah, well, let's look at that detail a little bit. Um, you can see it when we go upstairs to the second floor, but basically, if you look carefully here, you can see how the face of the uh, formwork, there's a special form that's a brick ledge, so it kind of swoops up like that. Well, normally, you're using that on the outside, just below grade, to set your brick veneer. You don't need to make your whole foundation 12 inches thick or, or 4 inches thicker just to support the brick. So we looked at that and said, well, if we flip it around, we can set the trusses on that, and then we had to do a little study using our thermal bridge uh, software, Therm, to figure out, okay, so the concrete in there is relatively cold in terms of the entire building envelope. Um, is that going to bring, is that going to cool down our interior too much? We're going to get into potential condensation problems, et cetera. And so the detail we came up with that, that works is we're setting a, a two by four, a treated two by four plate which is the bearing plate for these trusses, on top of a 3 8 inch thick uh, closed cell polyurethane um, sill sealer. So that gives us a little bit of a break there. And then we're going to take uh, spray foam and do three inches of foam around that whole thing. So basically encapsulating that. And then um, that, that basically protects and keeps the cold out of the house. Because uh, remember, the concrete in the middle of winter, the concrete in here is going to be, we figured, roughly 40 degrees, I think, was the number. Do you remember, yeah, Eric? Where's Eric? Okay. So I think so, yeah. So the transmission of the coal coming through the 2 by 4 is multiplied by the insulation plus also the length of the 2 by 4 Yeah, well, primarily it's the insulation around it. Yeah, exactly. So and that thermal, and the gasket. Yeah, and, and that gasket, right. Yeah. Does, it, does it break down over time, that gasket? Well, it'll be gone. Well, <laughs> <laughs> oh, ozone. Wait, isn't your warranty a little longer than we? <laughs> yeah. um, no, it, the polyurethane, the uh, closed cell polyurethane is, is basically. Years. Yeah, <laughs> that's the problem yeah, if it's in the landfill. It's inert. Once it's, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Would you do anything for, say, like uh, renewable? Like, you mean what, what can you use for a sill sealer? That's no, like no, a. For renewable, say, like uh, oh. your uh, conduit for. Uh, yes. Yeah, it's, it's solar PV ready. Um, the state scrapped the PV rebates. They were ready to do a, a three and a half kilowatt array for this house. Yeah, and so now it's not there. So we have a, a solar photovoltaic system for, uh, I'm sorry, a solar thermal system for uh, domestic hot water uh, preheat out on the garage, and then it comes into a storage tank back there in the store. That's the basically utility room back there. Yeah. Yeah, we did do that at the stairway because the loads weren't too great. But remember, we wanted to keep this slab really simple, four-inch slab. And the, if you clear span it, you've got a lot of load right here. And so that would have made us have to thicken the slab and get a more difficult detail, potential thermal bridge problems. We, as it is, it's just really simple. Just flat, put down the foam, put down the slab, up go the walls. So um, your eight inches hits the wall? The yes. Oh, yeah. Yep. Yep. Overlaps the footing. And there's that. That's so important. There's the disconnect. Wrong. Absolutely. That's, the, that's one of the key details. Well, I thought the same thing as him because, you know, if you did that, and then uh, for this plane of insulation, you have to do this as well. But, so I'm not quite exactly sure. Well, you know, you're, it, it, there's a lot of ways to um, skin the passive house. <laughs> and, and a lot of people are doing double wall construction where they'll do an interior 2x4 structural wall with the exterior face of that 
sheathed with half inch plywood or OSB, which is the airtight layer, and then either a secondary stud out there or Larson trusses or TJIs, 12, 15 inches, whatever, to get all that insulation thickness. But then you get a simple stick frame, boom, two by four up. The only problem is you want to test your air tightness layer, but that means you're going to have to, you know, if you want to weather in your house, you're going to have to build the other wall, get the Tyvek on it, et cetera, et cetera. And so you've got a little more to deal with there. But there's a lot of ways to do it. And hopefully in the next year or so, we'll start to get a catalog together through FAIS of um, Passive House Alliance US of sort of catalog of details that US builders are using. There's a great book from Europe, <laughs> but they just build differently enough there that uh, we can't really use a lot of those details. For instance, you, in, in Germany, the, T, the, the TJI company has, uh, you can do uh, TJI walls, uh, you know, studs, as studs. But here, they haven't been run through ICC, so the code officials need to see a, a book of calculations, um, you know, of, of structural engineering calculations. So what would be the thermal break? Well, then you would do a, a separate wall. To, so you do the TJI structural wall, you sheath it on the inside, tape it, you know, make it airtight, and then stand off a wall like this. So that's where you run all your, all this stuff, and you've got that nice, clean, untouched, unplumbing and unelectrical uh, airtight layer. Yeah. Even though all that mechanical is basically inside the envelope, if you were to make three inches of close-up foam, let's say, and encapsulate each one of that first thing that's the exterior part of it, uh, well, let, let's talk after the meeting. I'm not quite picturing it, and we should probably circulate. But yeah, there's another way to skin it. I'm sure. Yep. That's right. So this ventilation system is moving the air through the house constantly, right? It's exhausting from all the, the wet areas and supplying to the living areas. So we've got a couple of yeah. supply. Yeah. But one of the interesting things when you do the PHPP, the Passive House Planning Package Energy Calculations on the building, you can see where you're losing your heat, right? And our heat losses to the ground are pretty minimal, So, which is intuitive, right? I mean, the, the temperature here isn't as bad as the temperature here when it's uh, you know, middle of the winter. So we don't have as much to worry about here. So yeah, we're not doing that. And no radiant heat in the floor is a question a lot of people ask. If we were to put radiant heat in the floor and get it up warm enough that you could feel that it's warm, we'd overheat the house immediately. Because, you know, your skin temperature is, is, is what are in the upper 80s or something like that. So you've got to have a, a warm floor, but we need so little heat in here that radiant heat doesn't really make sense. With the loads that we have. Yeah, well, that's that kind of goes with what I was saying earlier about the fact that we don't have a ducted, conditioned air system, and the the ventilation system is just making sure that fresh air is getting distributed to the house and exhausted from the areas where pollutants are made, basically the kitchen, bathroom, laundry, etc. Uh, well, th it the foam. Yeah, this is the thermal break. Okay. So in other words, you go right to the foam. Yeah. Right. That's yeah. What yeah. yeah. Little, little expansion again. That's it. All right. Why don't we head up to this, all the way up to the second floor. Um, watch your step. There's a couple uneven steps up there at the top. And then you we'll. Can, you can see on the stairs, if you want to look at the brick ledge detail. Yeah. On the, on the second floor landing. Yeah. Why does that get out? This, that, that's an interruption. Oh. Yeah, that this is an interruption in the uh, the foam. It's a small. Do you see what I manipulate? Do you want to grab it? No. What do you need to respond to? Oh, just that my little handle for the. Oh, maybe I am. It's down by my bag. Ready? You good? Okay. So, a um, couple of good questions on the way up here. Um, one thing I just totally forgot to to talk about was the how the entire wall system is is made up. So. There's the ICF system itself, which is gets you about an R28. Eric, up here yet? Yeah. Is that right? R28? Um, but we needed about an R50. So at first we thought, well, let's just put, let's just fur out those walls to the inside and put a whole bunch of fiberglass 
or cellulose insulation. Um, but while it would be fine to do an ICF wall and just put drywall on the inside if you needed an R28, if for us to do that means that we're putting a lot of insulation between us and the ICFs, which means we're keeping those ICFs really cold. So if any air can get into there, it could get it could hit a plane that could be a condensation plane. So we had to study this thing and figure out how much we could afford to put insulation on the inside, and therefore we had to put the rest of the insulation on the outside. So um, the sweet spot that we found was two inches of polyiso insulation on the outside of the ICFs. The siding goes on top of that on a rain screen application. And then we have these two by four walls stood off of the, the uh, inside face of foam by half an inch. So we have four inches and we're using a blown-in bat fiberglass insulation system so that basically the, uh, the, the studs get netted, you blow in the, how, well, you, you explain it, you're the, you're the blown-in bat guy. So the walls are netted and uh, we blow in the fiberglass insulation. It's a Green Guard certified fiberglass insulation and with netting it you don't have any worry about particulate in the, in the air so it's still a healthy product and with the Green Guard there's no formaldehyde or phenol added to the product that we use um, so it's still very healthy. Uh, basically, they overfill the cavity a little bit so it bows out. And when you push your drywall on, you're recompacting that and making sure there's no voids in the insulation. You have six points of contact, um, and nothing's ever going to settle with the fiberglass. It's not blown in wet, so you're not, nothing's drying out and has the opportunity to settle over time. So you're going to have that uh, R value in that wall forever at that install. What do you call that? Uh, it's called bibs, blown in bib, uh, blown in bats. It's not like No. Thanks. Yep. Um, okay, that was question one. Question two was about these uh, whips here. Um, so you'll see in the house a, a number of places where you have these uh, soffits framed like this. We're doing a lot of ambient lighting using indirect uplight out of these coves. So there's going to be a piece of wood trim here that hides a T5 fluorescent uh, linear fixture. T5s are really, really efficient. And of course, we're looking not just for thermal efficiency, but also uh, overall energy efficiency on the house. So um, we try to use those in a lot of places. You'll see that big one down the in the, the living dining space and then up here um, and then in a couple of bedrooms. So um, that's this is just really easy stuff to frame soffits out of. Um, this is our airtight layer and it's almost watertight too. We had a nice big rainstorm the other day. Um, and so basically all the seams of the plywood get taped. Um, Ran out of tape, so there's a couple places of stuff to get hit. But um, this is typical passive house strategy. Uh, the real trick of this was how do we connect it to the concrete of the wall, our air barrier of the wall. So the deal there was um, I came up with something really good and difficult and uh, strong-armed Eric into doing it. Um, so at the top of the ICF, there's a treated two-by laid in, which is the bearing plate for the roof trusses. And um, so before we set that thing in, we took this heavy plastic and laid it underneath where that was going to be, okay? So that plastic goes out. It tapes to the outside face of the um, ICF form, and then it comes in continuously and tapes off to the air barrier of the ceiling. So that was our way to do that with kind of off-the-shelf stuff. Um, and then the ceiling is just continuous. We've got a couple penetrations, um, which take some serious gasketing. Uh, any place is a penetration, which, you know, is very carefully controlled by Brandon and Eric, um, gets one of these gaskets. And we, we still have to cut back these a little bit to, you know, fit them up perfectly. But there's a company called 475 Supply. Is that their official name, 475? High Performance Supply, yeah. And they've got gaskets. They've got... Um, they got a whole bunch of products that you can get uh, sort of passive house type components from. And they're in New York. So, um, yeah, that's, that's basically the ceiling. And then we're putting uh, two feet of that pink blown in fiberglass in the attic for about an R100 on the ceiling plane. It's basically easy at that point. We just kind of filled it until we hit passive house certification. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of dials to turn. Um, and uh, yesterday there was a fascinating um, webinar, it was really great to see, about how you can put what they call a dashboard onto this PHPP software to be able to do things like tweak 
uh, your assembly R values, sort of dial them up and down before you've sort of entered it all into the software. I, well, this is this would take a long time to describe, so sorry about that. But anyway, the point is that it's a whole systems approach. So walls, ceilings, floor, it just all has to work together. Windows, um, amount of solar gain for you know wintertime heating, amount of shading for how much wintertime heating we're not getting, and for uh, how much summer cooling we're going to spend. We've calculated everything down to the, you know, the, the, the watt, pretty much. So, uh, what else up here? Anything? Uh, so, so traditionally, you know, this house has uh, four bathrooms, a half bathroom, one laundry room up here, one in the basement. That's the future possibility of a laundry room. We were able to talk the plumber into doing only two uh, vents for all his plumbing, which wasn't traditional for him. So you can see there's a lot of sideways and horizontal uh, vent pipes, we were able to get all of our penetrations through two with our plumbing, and then we have our radon reduction system as a third PVC through the roof. So really minimized our penetrations there. The only uh, electric penetrations are one uh, conduit for future solar PV, and the other one for an attic light, which we had to have by code, unfortunately. But no one's going to go up and play in two feet of insulation. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because these holes are inside, you know, the stack effect, you yeah. say? Ah, uh, good question. Uh, right now we're looking at a system that's called the vacuum seal uh, attic cast door. Um, we're still trying to get the specs on that, but that's one one option we're looking for there. Um, it actually has about R65 built in, R60, R65 as insulation and airtight vacuum seal. So there are a couple things that we had to deal with with the building official in designing the passive house. That was one of them. We didn't want to put an attic hatch in at all. I shouldn't say that. We wanted to put an exterior attic hatch just in case maybe sometime you needed to get up there and just make it a door. You put a ladder up and climb way the heck up there and get in. But on the gable end. On the gable end of the roof, above the insulation level. And he said, well, the code requires, uh, and it's true, it does, it says, it, uh, you know, it needs to be readily accessible from the inside. And I, I, I don't really know why, but I assume it's a fire safety thing. That you, if there's a fire up there, you can put it out. I'm not sure. Anyway, um, we had to put it in. So we, we battled back and forth, and he said, no, you've got to do it. Uh, the other thing that was interesting was that he gave us a plan review note that said, um, you need ducted returns out of all your bedrooms for your mechanical system. It's like, well, there's no mechanical system except, well, We've got, we've got one sitting in the sea where it says HVAC right there written on the wall. And you can see the line set coming in. So that's the second Mitsubishi mini split sitting there. So, um, so that, was, that was kind of funny when we got there. were a couple others that were really specific. Do you remember? Yeah, vapor barrier on the inside of the wall. Oh, yes. Yeah, you want a vapor barrier on the inside of the wall. Um, so we had to show them, you know, just information from the Logix ICF. One of the good things about Logix is a, is a block installers, they have all the details and all the testing and just it's a lot of good information. Do you know the heat load? Yeah, yeah, the, 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 the heat load in terms of how many BTU hours? 13,500 is the max. Yeah. And uh, that comes straight out of the PHPP. So that's, that's at, uh, you know, the, the way PHPP calculates heat load is interesting. It looks at two scenarios. One, uh, sort of a long string of cloudy days, which tend to be with by, they use climate models, right? So we're looking at the Chicago climate models. A long string of gray days in this climate tends to be in the 20s, teens, you know. It's snowing a lot, like for a week. And you're not getting a lot of solar gain. So it, it looks at that as a model. The other scenario, though, is it's super cold. It's 15 below. Well, those are those Arctic days when you've got a ton of sunlight. So it, you can't, I, I, don't, I don't think our climate history shows like you know, 20 below or 15 below and cloudy. So it looks at those two scenarios and figures out what's the worst case and gives you that as your heat load. So these systems here, the, the rated capacity is 9,000 uh, BTU hour each. So we're a little over, but that's their smallest unit. So it was a little too, it was a little too, um, too much to just have one unit and a little too much distribution. We talked to the Mitsubishi rep who was an engineer and he said, do, do two and you'll be really comfortably covered. At first we had the idea of putting some radiant heat in the, uh, the floors, just like electric radiant mats in the bathroom floors, just, just turn on for a little bit and have a little supplemental heat, but 
we just scrapped it and said forget it. We don't need it. So. I'm showing your corner window. Oh yeah. Concrete. Well, let me tell you a little bit about the, lay the layout up here. This is um, the kids' rooms are the front one and this one. The kids' bath is over there. You're kind of clustered around the laundry room right there. And then this is a den uh, family area. Uh, and this is all the master suite. So initially, in the early parts of design, we had, I had a lot of corner windows going on. Um, but ultimately realized that a lot of places where I'd put corner windows were looking into like the neighbor's garage and that sort of thing. So we eliminated it. Um, so this one here, though, really opens up the master bedroom. We decided to keep it in. Uh, and Zola sent it to us in two pieces. The, you know, they, they basically butted together and got sealed um, on site. And so therefore, there's a fair amount of uh, we talk about the, what happened with the concrete and the forming. And well, I mean, there's a, you know special rebar details, you know, for the concrete header there. But but basically, it's a cantilevered concrete corner, no structural support in the corner from the windows or anything. So it was kind of cool. Which the structural engineer goes, oh yeah, no problem. You just like I'll put some bars in there. And then Eric's going, are you sure? He's like, oh yeah, sure. You know, that's not, I mean, frankly right. Would have made that go like ten more feet. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we're late, we're tame here. So. Um, uh, one, another interesting thing that came up in the PHUP calculation, so we're doing this as a certified passive house, which means we need to send all our calcs and our designs and our specs and absolutely everything to FIAS, which is the Passive House Institute U.S. They're the training and certifying body. And FAIS, the Passive House Alliance, is the sort of outreach and education arm. So anyway, FIAS is certifying this. Graham, the guy who's um, our, my, our personal reviewer, is just absolutely honed in on all the details and the master of this. PHPP software. And one of the things he said is like, you know, it looks like your plumbing run calculation looks a little bit low. So when you're calculating the energy in the, you know, the heating energy it's going to take and the, and the primary energy that the whole building is going to take, you've got to look at things like, okay, how many feet of domestic hot water do I have running in here? Because that's going to be using energy to heat up the water and putting that heat, depending on your R value that you're putting around your hot water pipes, um, dumping that into the house. So that's less that the, the mini split needs to run. And if you have 300 feet versus 75 feet of pipe, it's going to make a big difference in your calculation, a huge difference. I didn't realize there were a couple of things. <laughs> I'd also put in too high of a number for the Zender efficiency. Oh, God. And it's a very efficient system, it's one of the highest. But I had, I had put a wrong number in. We've got more units. Yeah? Give you a higher number. Okay. Well, let's talk. We'll talk afterwards. Because um, so all these things that you don't necessarily know until you've really run PHP a lot, where it's going to hit you. But anyway, um, we uh, we had way under calculated the pipe, just as he said. I think we had like a placeholder number in there, and then we went through and calculated each line. And the thing is, these sort of houses on narrow lots tend to get spread out, right? So I mean, we sort of have the plumbing stuck together here, but as much as we could. But still, the you know, master bath is way back there. And yeah, we could have put the master closet on the back wall and not had windows in the bathroom looking out. But you know, design-wise, we didn't want to go with that. So um, what we found was that there's a, there's a lot of pipe. And um, it, it really lowered our heat load, but it upped our primary energy. Because we're using more energy to heat water and lose it into the house in the wintertime. So um, it was, uh, that was a bit of a surprise. So basically, in an ideal passive house, it's a really compact shape. It's got great south orientation. It's got the plumbing all kind of joined together close, and um, it doesn't have too many crazy air tightness details. Well, we, we left that number alone. We didn't need to up it, but it's already like an R8. So, yeah. We could, but the thing is, we, um, we, we talked about that, and, and there was a difference in price, you know, and uh, we have a tank downstairs, which is our solar thermal storage tank, and then that just goes to a simple electric uh, heater to add what little bit of heat needs to go into the domestic hot water. So, But that, we did go through that as a question. It's a good question. Yeah. Yeah, we're putting in, uh, that's going to get filled up with a blown-in bat fiberglass. Well, yeah, I mean, 
amount of insulation we have in the walls is just going to keep whatever heat we have that we're losing inside the house. But what you see is that it takes away from the energy that you have to use for your mechanical heat, but it adds to whatever you're doing for your water heat. You follow? You are delivering warmth. But you could, you could heat this house entirely with incandescent bulbs. But that would be a really inefficient way to do it, and your primary energy would go through the roof. You could also heat this house really easily with this number of people. In fact, in the wintertime, we'd be, uh, you notice how warm it's getting in here? It's, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's right, just about. Okay, so why don't we go downstairs and hear from Barry and company about Zender.